All right, everyone, welcome back. Let's take our seats. We're actually going to kick off our series of panels. We're going to be starting with serving unhoused members of your community. As public libraries have become a refuge for the unhoused members of the community, they serve as a place of shelter, safety, rest, facility usage, and informational resources. In this panel, we will explore different ways that Bay Area libraries are serving and engaging this population. This panel will be moderated by Abby O'Neill, Library Services Manager of Contra Costa County Library, and she will be joined by Kimberly Buckley, Senior Community Library Manager of the Contra Costa County, Gia Paolini, Senior Community Library Manager of the Contra Costa County Library, and Derek Wolfgram, Library Director of the Redwood City Public Library. If you would like to learn more about the panelists on this panel and later panels, I encourage you to look at the brief bios provided with the agenda. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Abby, and we're going to start. I'm delighted to be here with this esteemed panel. And we will leave time at the end of the panel discussion uh, for questions. So if you have any, please let us know when we get to the end. Our first question is for Kimberly. What organizations have helped navigate in assisting and managing the influx of unhoused individuals? Well, hi, everybody. I am Kimberly. Um, I feel like to answer this question, I need to go back a little bit and talk about when I first started working at the library that I managed, which is the Concord Library in Contra Costa. And when I started there, we, had a, we have a very large homeless population um, that it, uh, Actually, I think Concord has the largest population in the, the Contra Costa County. So when I got there, the culture was basically, we don't talk to them, we don't, we don't acknowledge them, we don't do anything with them. And if they do anything that we don't like, we call the police on them. And that just didn't sit very well with me. So I spent several years, and I think it was about two or two to three years, trying to figure out ways that I could work closely with our unhoused and help them and make them feel more welcome. So what happened, it happened by accident that um, I had someone from Shelter Inc., which is a, an organization in Concord, ask me um, if they could rent our meeting room. And I thought to myself, yeah, sure, you can rent our meeting room. Can I talk to you and like find out um, ways that I could help our unhoused folks in the library? And so we had a conversation. We talked. They introduced me to their operations director. And um, so we talked more and we came up with a plan. We were going to collaborate together and we created a, um, a forum for uh, Homelessness Awareness Month, which was in November. And through that, I was able to meet with more organizations. I met someone from our, uh, it's Health, Housing, and Homeless, and it's in the Contra Costa County. They call it the H3 who was, an, um, she is an amazing person. She knows so many different like service providers and different resources. So through there, I was able to meet more and more people. And so it, it, it really helped to have these um, resources and different types of providers so that I could, like our staff and myself could start like offering this information to our own house patrons because like I said we were just not even acknowledging that they were there and I just felt that that was just not that was just not okay so I feel like um I'm gonna save I have lots more to share but I'm gonna save that and like we'll go on to our next question thank you Kimberly next question is for Derek what are the common issues facing libraries community members and partners in managing the ever-growing unhoused population Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Derek Wolfgram from Redwood City. Um, yeah, I want to start just echoing something that um, Kimberly said, you know, just in a slightly different way that I, I tend to think of our unhoused, po you know, population, the people that we're trying to help um, in that way, rather than as a population to be managed as, as humans to be assisted. I think that that's a really important framework going in. And you know these are broad issues that are we have our own unique sets of things that we talk about in the library and we'll deal with that. But these are pervasive societal issues. They affect every department of government. You know it affects police. It affects fire. It affects public works. It affects parks. Um, it's happening across the city 
all of the nonprofits um, in the community touch homelessness in some way because it, you know, it's about hunger, it's about economic opportunity, it's about mental health. There are just, you know, all of these things are completely pervasive, and there is nothing that, you know, we can do alone to remedy this uh, this terrible issue that that our communities have. Um, and so that collaboration, like Kimberly talked about, and as we'll talk about more, I think is really what's um, essential. You know, in San Mateo County, where Redwood City is located, um, our county is super ambitious. They have a plan that they are really trying to at least functionally end homelessness. And in addition to the county having bought a few hotels to provide um, individual living spaces, uh, the county is in the process of building a navigation center that's going to have 240 individual rooms in it for people to live in, as well as all of the mental health services and uh, wraparound uh, social services that are needed to help people um, once they have a place to live, start moving forward with, uh, you know, improving their lives in other ways. And so um, we're all part of that effort, and um, I hope we get there. Thank you, Derek. Question number three, Gia, what are some building issues such as unhoused patrons using the bathroom to bathe or wash or change clothing, and how does that get managed. And again, I, I think Derek's point about the word managed is really, really a significant point. So thank you. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Gia, and I work at the San Pablo Library in Contra Costa County. Um, our city is about between 30 and 40,000 people currently. Um, I think you said it very well when you said manage. Every person here who works in a public library or has been in a public library is very aware of the issues that you can be experiencing as library staff, visitors, community members when you're dealing with trying to manage a situation with your restrooms, your public restrooms, and the things that can happen in there. Um, it's always a tightrope of having compassion for the folks that need the services, that they need the bathroom, and the community members who have expectations of the use of the bathroom, and they're also trying to use the bathroom, of the staff members who have expectations about what they're gonna be doing as far as managing restroom issues, um, and being able to really hear your staff, hear the community, and here are the people who need the bathrooms. Um, and yeah, it's just managing and just being aware and listening to your staff, listening to the public, listening to the needs of the people that are using the bathroom and paying attention. Um, Nobody is expecting anybody to manage the bathroom or stand outside. <laughs> um, but it's just a lot of uh, just being aware. You know, sometimes just if you can, stick your head in there. And just make sure everybody's doing okay. Like, are you all right? Do you need me to call someone for you? And just having compassion for them. What's your name? You know, I've seen you here before. Are you okay? Sometimes people answer and sometimes they don't. Um, and the other thing too that was really helpful for us is just really getting to know the cleaning crew and the cleaning staff um, and just asking them, like, are there, you know, how's stuff going? Like, let us know if anything is going on in there that we need to know about. And they tell us, you know, and there are things sometimes that they bring to our attention that have been really invaluable and really helped us problem solve and work backwards to offer things to folks. Um, especially uh, we started uh, with the Amp Flow project where we've been offering free menstrual products to the community. And that's been a learning curve for everybody because some people in the community are not interested in that or they've been abusing it. Um, but I would say overall, it's been really positive. But yes, again, it's just managing. Can I add on to that? Um, I just, I just want to say part of the tool that a lot of libraries have for, for this kind of management you know, is a behavior policy of some sort that sets guidelines. And we recently did kind of an equity lens review of all of our policies. And um, 
I was surprised to find how much stuff we had in our behavior policy that was really written as if it was targeting unhoused people. And so we really tried to um, create a document that provides a welcoming atmosphere, but still manages the things that need to be managed. You know, there were, there were three examples in there that I can think of off the top of my head. One was we had a prohibition against bringing shopping carts onto the library property. Well, first outside that's unenforceable anyway, by law, we can't do anything about it. Um, but you know, Functionally, the reason we can't have shopping carts is because it blocks access to things. It blocks access to furniture, to pathways, to collections, to spaces. And so we just made our policy say, you can't have anything that blocks access to spaces. That's true of somebody who brings in a big computer setup. That's true of somebody who brings in a shopping cart. It's all the same. Um, we also found that we were um, enforcing our no sleeping policy inequitably. If it was a student that fell asleep, probably nobody was going to bother them. If it was somebody that looked homeless, somebody probably was going to bother them. Um, and ultimately, if it's not disrupting the library experience of somebody else, who cares? So we took sleeping out of the behavior policy. Sleeping is fine if you want to sleep at the library, as long as you're not impacting someone else's um, experience in a negative way. Um, and then the last piece of language, um, which I, I, I hate to point out while we're here at the wonderful San Francisco Public Library, but I, I realized when I went into the restrooms here that the language we changed was language we had originally taken from San Francisco's behavior policy, which talks about laundering, bathing, shaving, or other inappropriate uses of the restroom. There's no need for that judgment. The word inappropriate doesn't have to be there. Just specify the behaviors. My thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly, what types of programs have you initiated to engage the unhoused in the library? And what were some of the results? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is actually a, somewhere where I feel it's like very exciting for me because I had been doing all that work and making all those connections and so I had been following Dallas Public Library. They had been working, they had received a grant and they had been working on something called the um, their homeless engagement program and they called it Coffee and Conversation. So I started talking with our Shelter Inc. Um, collaborators and the H3 collaborators. And I said, what if we, what if we did a, program like that at the Concord Library would you would you be would you want to do that with me and they were like yes we would love to do that with you so we basically kind of just launched off of what Dallas was doing and we thought we would just do it the same way but a, a lot of what um, Derek was just talking about was kind of what we wanted to you know kind of preface in this engagement program was you know look we could we can help you get housing we can connect you with people who can get you clothing and food and if you need to go somewhere and get showers and that type of thing so i, I was really really hoping that it would work out um so our first idea was to actually be just like dallas and we <laughs> we called it coffee and conversation too um talk about like just not reinventing the wheel there and so what we did is we had um, we had our, our person come from the H3 and they were going to do just kind of give like a, um, you know, a, a kind of like a little talk. And then, you know, our goal was to try to get some of our unhoused patrons to come in and, and stay. So we offered donuts and coffee. And that first one was interesting. We we actually got two people to come in, and for us, that we were like, yes, we scored. You know, like two. A couple <laughs> of came in and got some donuts and left, and you know, we were excited about that too. So, but for some reason, we felt like that wasn't really what it didn't really stick. Like, what is this really what they need? Like, do they need to talk about something? And so. Then we had an idea because a lot of different service providers wanted to come to this meeting too. So we're talking about people who, you know, there's people called White Pony Express who deal with clothing. And, and then we had um, 
people from the mobile shower unit. And I mean, we just, uh, healthcare for the homeless, we just, it's just started kind of like being a big group. And so then my, I love, cause my, my collaborator, Jamie said, let's put everybody together with who they need, where they need help and who they need to talk to. And she called, she's like, it's kind of like speed dating, but not right. But anyway, it turned out to be like a, such a great thing. So that at some point within a few months, we started having like maybe 15 to 20 unhoused folks show up and then 15 providers and service providers and resource officers. So, and so we were doing this once a month and we were getting people from all over the county coming and it was, it was really amazing. It was a very exciting time. Even the city was coming and they were bringing the mayor. I mean, it was really great. So uh, we kept that going until, until March, 2020, and then it got shut down. And so we haven't been doing it since, but I do want to bring it back. And then I just want to say that there were several other libraries that we and ended up initiating initiating that and um, it had it went well. So I don't but that's the that's what I where I've gone with the programming and I think it really can work and it can really make a difference. And I learned so much and met so many different people. And another thing about when we're talking about, you know, bathing in the restroom or sleeping in the library, I, we really need to know what these folks are going through. And I learned a lot about that. I met people who had been homeless and living on the streets for like eight to 10 years. And they told me, they said, this is what we need. We don't need you to like give us a bag, big bag of stuff that we're never going to use. You know, we need these specific items and we, and we just want to come in and we just want to rest for a little bit because we don't sleep at night. We do not sleep at night. None of us sleep at night. And so, you know, it was, it was a pretty, I think for me and my staff, it was pretty amazing to be able to like start bonding with our unhoused folks and start seeing them all the time and then see a smile on their face when they come in like, hi, how are you? Like, and they feel like, that's a, that's a great thing for us to be able to do that. So I, I'm a, I would love to continue that program. And I think that other, I think anyone else that can do it should try to do it as well, because it, it doesn't take a lot to do it. Thank you. And that kind of segues into our next question with Derek. Uh, for libraries with staff, specifically social workers or staff trained in benefits navigation, what has been the impact and effect? Thank you. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with following up a little bit on what Kimberly said and then work my way around to it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's hugely important about the actual communication and the actual engagement and, um, you know, avoiding the misguided efforts. Uh, I'll never forget 25 years ago when I was a brand new reference library and at the Denver Public Library main library. Um, it was around Thanksgiving time and had a gentleman who appeared to be homeless came up to the reference desk with a frozen turkey and said, do you know any place I can cook this? Um, so, you know, sometimes the, the disconnect between people that are trying to help and the realities of the people that need the help uh, doesn't work out. So we, we took, um, we were exploring the idea of a social worker a few years back and we didn't, we weren't able to come up with the money for it. So we took a different twist on kind of the program that Kimberly described. Uh, we had a, uh, an open uh, session that we called social service office hours that I connected with a number. There, there was a collaborative of organizations serving um, people who are homeless, people with mental Ill, illness issues, people with substance abuse issues. And, um, you know, none of us could none of us could afford a full time person, but each of those agencies could afford a couple hours a week. So we set regular times and we set up that the library was essentially an outreach venue for all of these other agencies. We're used to going out and tabling at community events, but it actually works really well to have others come and do their tabling inside the library. And, um, you know, we saw some some great results from that. Um, Never forget there was there was a time that I had I went and talked to one of our regulars that was sitting in the reading room and asked him how he was doing because he looked a little uh, he looked a little you know out of sorts and um, he said well I'm really happy but I'm really sad and um, I said why is that and he said well I met with Life Moves at the uh, at the social service office hours and they found me a place to live I'm like well that's fantastic that's wonderful. And he said, but it's in 
East Palo Alto, so I'm not going to be able to come and spend every day at the Redwood City Library anymore, um, which that was the sadness was he was going to, you know, miss the the caring that he was shown at the library. So I thought that was uh, beautiful. So you can, you know, you don't need the full budget to do everything. You can do something a little more grassroots. I do think the libraries that have done uh, work with social workers, um, San Francisco is one of the is one of the early leaders in that. And they have done just tremendous work to get people connected with benefits and to connect, get people connected with housing. And, you know, I've heard um, Leah Esquera, who started the program, talk many times. I know she's talked at some other PLP workshops. And um, just the fact that they built up that program, leading with compassion, leading with empathy, and really trying to um, Put some put some power and some money behind helping people get assistance really has made a difference. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Gia, how do police departments and or security play into again the word managing incidents? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so. <clears throat> um, the police department that um, for our city are actually pretty proactive, um, engaged um, police department. Um, they did show up to our coffee and conversation <laughs> for the first few rounds of it that we had until I had someone from the group approach me afterwards and say, why did you bring the police here? Was it to watch me? And I was like, well, no, it, it's just so that you can talk to them about any issues that you're having with, you know, law enforcement. And he was like, well, I'm not coming back. So it was like, oh, <laughs> OK. So that was kind of a tough one. Um, it was it, we lucked out, though, because the police decided that, that they were going to be engaged elsewhere during that time. So they actually kind of quit coming. And then we actually got some more attendance to the program. So just kind of checking in with your police department and checking in to make sure that the folks who, you know, if they're coming in to do activities with you, just make sure that the people that you're serving feel safe around the police and um, get to know your beat captain, get to know the chief of police, uh, try to engage with city council and your community partners to make sure that everybody is on the same page and that they know where you stand. Because if there are incidents where we have to call the police, sometimes it's kind of a push and pull where they're like, I know that person, do you want us to get him out of here? And it's like, well, for the day. And they're like, well, we'll tell them. And then that we, they go outside and they're like, never come back here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, well, we can't do that. So it's just kind of making sure that the police know the rules of the library and in Contra Costa County, we're not allowed to actually suspend people forever. Um, we just hand them suspension papers if that's necessary and let them know this is your end date. Um, but we don't tell people don't ever come back here. And I always try to tell people if we're having a problem, you know, hey, man, you just need to stay out for a week. And then after that, you're welcome to come back in. We're still friends. You know, everything is, is good. Just, you know, we just need a break from each other for a week and just try to be like sympathetic with folks because they're having a bad day. And um, sometimes you just need to draw those boundaries and just make sure the police understand that because there's so many times where I've had to talk to somebody and just tell them like, don't tell them they can never come back because that's not the point of this conversation. And then the same thing will often go with our security because they're a contracted company. Sometimes we see a different person every single day. So we just try to make sure that we have a good conversation with whoever is our security staff that day and make sure they understand the rules of engagement as well. Um, and they, and they, do, they do pretty well. Um, sometimes they do stand back a little bit too much and we have to kind of like encourage them to come to engage with us and just uh, make sure that they're supporting the staff. And just having an open line of communication with the security company as well is really important because that can kind of make or break your ability to, just serve, to serve that community is if you have a positive relationship with security and the police. 
And I know in Gia's case, her staff also feels empowered when things aren't going well. Uh, there was a security officer there who was not engaging well um, with pretty much all of the patrons at, at a certain point. And that staff person called me and I said, you know, we'll get somebody new out there. So that's truly important as well. It's not just leadership who feels that level of comfort with security and police, but it should be the entire staff uh, feeling that autonomy and, and empowered uh, notion to be able to react to things when they're not going well, um, and not just with our customers. Uh, Kimberly, how did you start teaching a course on serving unhoused patrons for the San Jose State University MLIS program? Thank you, Abby. Um, here's another great story about how I kind of fell into something. <laughs> um, I hit, my colleague and I decided that we were going to present at the CLA, I think it was the, the 2019, and we were going to present about coffee and conversation and, you know, talk about all the things that came about and how great it was and how, and, you know, kind of lay down then how everyone could do it. It was, it was really fun. So through that, um, someone from San Jose State, in the master's in library program contacted me and said, we would really like a class here, um, you know, on serving homeless patrons in the library. Could you do that? And I was like, I guess so. <laughs> I've always wanted to teach and, you know, and went into library studies instead. And so I thought, hey, I'll give it a shot. So I, it was going to be a four week course. I designed it and I went through every thought that I could think of that would be helpful for you know someone in library school to know before they went to work in a library because uh, I know my first experience in the library with the, with the when we had someone who came in unhoused and my co I had a coworker just start screaming at them and saying get out get out and I was thinking of that when I was doing this because I I really don't think that you know sometimes you just you just don't know what to expect. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about the, the barriers and the challenges that they face. We talk a lot about, um, you know, different things that will happen in the library and a lot of things that we've been talking about here already. And then, you know, the, the final part of the end of the course is for them to plan their own homeless engagement program. And so I, so San Jose State was like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. So I taught my first class. Uh, I think it was right around when the pandemic began. And um, I had 60, more than 60 students and that and it's all online. And, you know, that's for me, it was just, I was like, whoa, you know, it's a lot of students, but to think about that, they, that they will all at least be somewhat prepared or knowledgeable or, and have, and have that understanding, um, before they even start working in a library, I think is really important. And so I'm, I'm still teaching it and I teach it in the spring and the summer. And I just wanted to add on to that, too, that I think an important piece that I always kind of direct uh, most people to is um, Mr. Ryan Dowd's book, um, The Librarian's Guide to Homelessness. I think that that is a crucial book for everyone to read, even if you're not in library school. It's very helpful. It talks about a lot of different approaches. And so I'm going to probably talk a little bit later about the staff training, but I, I really feel that that book is is really important in our work. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, <clears throat> next question for Derek. Uh, do you ever have to balance frustrations among community members and or staff that might not think favorably of the unhoused in the library? Uh, and if so, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about one individual and one situation. Uh, the individual is a crusty old guy that is a former mayor of Redwood City. Um, and to, to use his language, uh, every time I see him at a community event, he tells me that he's not, uh, he's not going to come to the library's events and he's not going to give us any money um, until we do something about the bums in the library. Um, and uh, I just tell him that uh, we're going to have to to get by without his generosity or his charming company because... Uh, you know, we we welcome the bums to our library. This is a this is a place that is a haven for them in our community. And so, uh, if you don't like it, you can you can take your privilege elsewhere. Um, one one interesting situation that we had uh, over this past summer was we had uh, an encampment that grew up in the park next to our library. Um, 
which started with a couple people very quietly pitching tents and sleeping there. And um, we barely noticed that they were there. And um, based on conversations with our police department, uh, they, they actually, um, they, they were very uncomfortable with the idea, even as we got things got a little crazier um, with the idea of removing people because there are, um, there are court cases that basically assert people's right to be on public property 24-7. Um, um, but uh, I had people immediately when we had these two tents in the, in the park that, you know, that's got to go. It's bad. It's scary. Children can't come to the library and have to see this, this horrible thing, which is, you know, people that our resources have not been able to, to care for is, is, in my opinion, the horrible thing that, that children were seeing. Uh, but people were scared and there were things on next door and there were things on social media. And um, we actually we actually did not engage with the social media. We just sort of let those conversations die out and let the encampment remain. Um, over a period of a few months, it did actually get to the point where it was problematic. Um, it grew to the point where it was about 20 people. Um, we were having a lot of needles left laying around. We were um, witnessing incidents of domestic violence. People who were in the encampment were um, making really unfortunate comments to our library customers as they were walking by. Um, sometimes racist, sometimes sexist or homophobic. It was it was pretty pretty brutal, um, and so we we decided that we did need to working with our homeless coordinator for the city and our police department that we needed to uh, evict the encampment. And fascinating, um, the community reaction and the staff reaction. There was a mirror in both that there were people who um, were like, yay, good, make it be gone. We don't want to have to look at it anymore. And then there were people who said, don't you have any compassion? Why are you forcing these people to move somewhere else? They don't have any place else to go. You know, why would you be so heartless? Um, and you know, we just had to explain that balance that we had, um, you know, we had existed, you know, peacefully side by side for as long as we could. But once the um, issues got to be uh, more severe and we got worried about safety, they started. Uh, some of the campers started having regular fires there, and there's you know, hundred foot redwood tree that they were burning their grills underneath, which would fall on the library if something happened to it. And so, you know, we had to, we had to move them along, but it was really interesting in that moment to see that balance of people who, and, and the same discussions happen with other encampments in Redwood City, the, the, we should have compassion, we should leave people alone, or we should not have to look at this. And then there are all sorts of people that are on the middle of the spectrum as well. Thank you. We are going to have one more question for the panel and then open it up to uh, audience questions. Uh, Gia, do we see a long-term or proactive solution to helping the unhoused, um, or are we mostly reacting to these circumstances? Um, before I get into, get into that, I just have been thinking, listening to us all here, um, I think everyone who's listening to us talk in your own library, you have an image of the people that you're helping and the people that are maybe causing issues and they're highly visible. But I just don't want us to forget about the invisible homeless that we are seeing every day that we may not know are homeless. Um, I feel like in my community, we have a core group of about 15 guys, uh, ladies, gentlemen, who we know and we're used to, they're used to us, they have a routine, we have our routine. But the people that are, and this leads into this question a little bit, um, the people who are precarious, um, the people who are suddenly finding themselves unhoused, this is happening so much more than it used to happen in 2019. 2020, 2021 hit my community so hard. Just blew people who are kind of precarious just straight out of the water. Um, we have a woman who has been staying with us for about three weeks now. She showed up and I just noticed that she had a child, like an eight-year-old with her during the day. 
And, we, and I was like, hey, what's going on? Why isn't this kid in school? Her car broke down in Hayward and it destroyed her. She couldn't get to work. Her landlord kicked her out. And now she has an eight-year-old and they're in the library all day. So it's the folks like that, I think, that uh, we're trying to really narrow our focus in and make sure they're being cared for, that the kid is getting fed, um, and that they're being directed towards resources that we have and that they know that they can safely be with us during the day while they're looking for resources. We have so many people who come in and I'm like, why are you here all day, every day? Like, you know, somebody who's wearing the same outfit every single day, the same, the person who's just struggling on the computer for eight hours every single day. Like, just keep an eye on those folks because they may be experiencing something that you're not cued into. They may not have a whole lot of belongings. They may not have everything that you might, might trigger your head that they're having a problem finding housing. But those are the people I'm finding that we're having more of. Um, and they're harder to spot, but I feel like that's the potential to get on top of the problem, which like leads into this question of um, being proactive. And like I said, watching people and observing people, what are their cues that they're giving to you? What are the things that they're saying to you? Do they have an ID? Like that's an old crinkled piece of paper. Like where are they getting their ID from? Just like little cues when they come up to the desk to ask questions, just like watch people and, and do it. Take care of people individually because that's where you'll head them off at the pass before they get into trouble. We've had community groups come in and, and just give us a card like, oh, hey, you know, I can kind of help people with paperwork. Okay. So I make a few copies of that and I just slide it on the table like, hey, you're having trouble with your ID. Here's somebody here that can kind of walk you through getting your driver's license back. Um, just little things like that can head people off at the pass and sort of stem a tide so that you're not just being reactive because that's where the problem is. If you're not watching and if you're just kind of letting this stuff happen to your community, letting it happen to your library, it's harder to deal with than if you're being proactive and watching your community, getting to know people, you know, hey, how's it going? My name's Gia, what's your name? You know, oh, hey, I just like, hey, do you need some snacks for your child? Um, the school district has been really great about bringing us food during the day to give to kids. And sometimes we break that out early for some of the kids who are not in school for some reason. We just try to connect them. So just being proactive instead of just letting stuff roll over you every single day is really helpful. So it's like the library has become the resource, not just the resource resource seeker. And, and that's, you know, really significant part of this, this experience with the unhoused and many of our, many of our customers. Um, we don't have any time for our questions because we <laughs> want to provide you with some time if you'd like to ask any questions to the panel. Somebody's going to come around with a microphone, I believe. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so one issue that we have at my library is that when we try to connect a patron to um, a service such as shelter or a drug treatment program, they often re um, require a reliable callback number. Um, and they may not call back for several days, if at all. Um, and of course, our reference line is staffed by different people throughout the week. So how do you assist patrons who do not have their own phones with a, sen with a sense of consistency? That's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I mean, I haven't, haven't had anyone that hasn't had a phone that I can think of. But in my, in my county, we have a group called CORE and we could call them, like the library can call them and they can come over and they can meet face to face if the person didn't have any contact phone. But I don't know, I don't know where, where you at. Yeah. We, what, I was asking, where, where are you at? Sunnyvale. You're in Sunnyvale. Do you, do you know if there's anything like that in Sunnyvale where there's a group that, that work that maybe is with the county and their what do they call that Gia the outreach I forget what it's called sorry 
anything like that? Um, we do have a, a group that comes by and meets with people in person, but my understanding is that some of our regulars, they've either had bad experiences or they just, for, for whatever reason, specifically don't want to work with that group. Um, and so, and the shelter hotline that we have, they do require a callback number. Right. And there are some cell phone, some ways where they can get a cell phone. There's like programs to get free cell phones as well, I think. But I haven't had that come up. And I'm going to maybe move over to you. Do you have something you want to say about yeah, that? Yeah, we, um, if we can, we tell them, we just give them the library public line and just have that person sit there for a while, um, which I know isn't possible. And if you have a larger, busier branch, because that's just going to be terrible for the staff trying to deal with that. But I, I, I give out the library number and say, hey, this person is just going to be chilling with us for a few hours and just call us back. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in our community, well, first, I think it's a, it's a conversation f with the service providers. Like, remember who you're serving here. Um, they may not have those resources and you may need to figure out an alternative way to contact people. Um, you know, I, I think in our community, uh, it's likely that our our homeless outreach team um, would be willing to you know go to where the person is to relay a message to them um, because they uh, they tend to know where um, at least the people who are are known um, you know where they're staying whether it's in an encampment or elsewhere um, you know, and that's that's recently changed for us. It's recently gotten better that we've hired a bunch of outreach workers who are more on the peer navigator. Uh, previously, our entire home, homeless outreach team was all police officers, and they're they're actually all um, they're all great humans. They're all great um, police officers that are very empathetic and very caring. But as we've discussed earlier. Uh, not every encampment wants a visit from a police officer, even if uh, even if they're coming to help. Thank you. Thanks. Um, if I could, I'm just a mic runner, but I just wanted to add that um, in Pleasanton, I heard that some of the churches are allowing uh, people experiencing homelessness to use their address as a residence, and then uh, as like an address, and then they also were taking um, probably phone messages for some people. So maybe your local churches might offer some That's insight fantastic. into that. So Gia, this question is for you. With the eight-year-old that's been in your library during the day, I guess it is, what have you done about that? Have you, you know, tried to get in touch with the school district? Because at our library, we try to make sure that the kids are in school and, and whatnot. So. Um, it was a rough one. <laughs> it was really hard because the ladies, the girl's mom, did not want to send her kid to the school that they had assigned to her. She was like, that's not a good school. So she kept the girl with her for a couple of weeks. And then finally we had just like a mini staff meeting. And I was like, hey, Precious can't sit here all day. What are we going to do? So we kind of... Uh, one of my librarians is married to a school teacher in the district, and then he kind of did some searching, and they got um, somebody from the school district actually came out to talk with Precious's mom and figure out a school that would work for her. So it was it was it was a little dicey. Like, um, a pre yeah, she was leaving Precious alone in the library too long, and it was just not a good situation and I tried to keep my hands off of it as much as possible because you don't want a kid to get taken um, that was just kind of our prime directive is like what is the worst and best case scenario that we can come up with here if we call the school district is this child going to be taken away from the only person that she knows so we had to be really 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 careful fortunately like everything kind of came together at the same time and uh, she's in school now, which is great. Um, unfortunately, Precious's mother is still looking for housing, um, so we're just kind of doing the best we can with that situation. 
This is about um, library card policy. So for us right now, you have to have a photo ID to get a library card. And so for unhoused patrons that come in that um, either don't have a photo ID um, or, or can't prove where they, you know, don't have a proof of address, um, it's more of maybe a case by case, like it, a, library act or, you know, maybe giving them a card for a day or something, but it's nothing streamlined that we're kind of wanting to have just a streamlined library card that anyone can get. Um, but that would mean changing our library card policy. So do you have any policies in place that are very friendly for unhoused patrons that might not have a photo ID specifically? Say, I, I can start with that one. Um, one of the things that we've done, uh, again, through that equity audit of policies that we did was we added a whole bunch of things to the list of acceptable ID, that it didn't have to be a government issued ID, that um, basically uh, very generous with anything that has a photograph and, a, um, and an address or two separate pieces of ID that have a photo and an address. Um, to try to make the the full card as accessible as possible. And then we do have for people with with absolutely zero ID, uh, it's it's not perfect, but we have uh, will issue a card that allows them to check out three items and to access everything. And so that that is some access. It's not full access uh, without the ID, but it's it's something. Yeah, and then also what we do, if a person can't manage anything, any kind of way to get a library card, um, we let them take whatever they want from the friends of the library. Um, and then the friends are really sweet, really nice guy. So he's like, yeah, absolutely. So we just are like, there's a box, take what you want, take what you want from the shelves, and people are happy to get that too. And my previous library system, I was... Uh, part of an initiative to figure out how to manage the library cards and not unlike Derek's system, take out three items, um, have access to the internet, provide um, at least some sort of availability and access uh, to both books and technology. And that, that has probably been one of the more common approaches uh, across the country because we did a bunch of research early on prior to that and found that as opposed to just as you mentioned um, out there about just giving temporary passes, uh, it gives and it also gives you know somebody a sense of connection to the library and um, sort of helps support what we stand for in terms of our access. I'll just throw out one more thing. Can we do thing. one more question in front here? I want to throw out one more thing. We also um, will will take the shelter's address as their address, and I've made many a card like that. So. It's, that's a very helpful thing, too. I'm sorry, we're getting the, uh, just like the Academy Awards, the music's <laughs> going to play us off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panel. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>